Greetings adventurers, this is DM Kurt and today I'd like to discuss the second edition Spelljammer ship to ship combat rules. Okay, so I have heard some complaints that the 5e Spelljammer books which just came out are incomplete or lacking in their ship to ship combat rules and I've heard claims that a book basically says, well, just lash the two ships together and, together and have everybody just fight it out on the deck. Lame. Okay, and I've heard that there's lack of rules for like, how do you get away from another ship? Okay, well, we simplify the rules. Maybe we simplify them too much and just tell the players, well, just fix it yourself. That's no way to run a product. Well, the way second edition Spelljammer ship to ship combat works, I'm going to give you a uh, kind of a simple um, overview. I'm not going to just read everything in the book to you. That'd be boring unless you wanted me to do books on tape, which, hey, you pay me, I'll happy to, be happy to do that. So, what we end up doing with 2nd Edition Spelljammer ships are, we get a hex map. Now, you don't have to use this. Use any hex map. I mean, pages in a book, just not the way to do it. But they include tokens that you could cut out. Or if you get the, uh, I, I, I hate cutting up a book. Get the PDF, print out that particular page, and cut that page out apart, okay? Don't do that to a poor innocent book. But anyway, you have your ships, and it's, and it's very important you have tokens or something like it that indicate the directions that the ships are facing. Okay, that's going to be an important part of the combat. You could, use, you could use a nickel with an arrow on it, okay? Doesn't matter. Your hexes are supposedly about 500 yards across. That's your scale, 500 yards or meters across. So, each ship has a facing, important. Movement, a ship's movement is calculated by its SR. Now that's SR, or spell jammer rating, is gonna be in its description. And what it is, is based on the type of spell jamming device, the spell jammer helm, and the level of the mage that's using it, or cleric, or whatever spellcaster. Some of the non, non-humanoids have their own weird ways of doing it, but you're gonna wanna get a major helm, because it uses the best chart, and the highest level person who's a spellcaster that you can get, all right? Movement. You're running your hundreds of millions of miles per day when you're at warp speed, but when you enter into combat, because a, an item that's 10 ton or, or greater got within whatever distance of you, you had to slow down to impulse speed. I'm going to, hey, I'm going to steal some terms out of Star Trek. I don't care. They're not, it's just a term, all right? So, your ship's movement at this combat speed is determined by your SR. A ship can move one space, one hex, or turn your facing direction by one hex side, so that's why facing is important, by one point per your SR. Okay, and depending on your maneuverability class, how you move. If you are maneuverability class F, because it goes A through F, you cannot change facing as your first action. They must move into the hex they are facing at the start of their turn before any turning is allowed. So it's tick, 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 you know, like that. Ships of class D and E cannot change facing by more than one hex side within a single hex in a single turn. So they can turn a little sharper, but not by much. Class B or C can change facing by up to two hex sides in a single hex. And ships of class A can change their direction, null facing, facing at will, in the direction of choice, even 180 degrees backwards. A ships of class A does not expend SR when changing facing. So, maneuverability F is like a uh, tractor trailer rig or uh, a school bus pulling a sailboat. I mean, something like that. And maneuverability class A is like a hummingbird or a dragonfly. Just zip, zip, zip. Or, you know, a remote control drone. Just any direction, any facing, doesn't matter. Right? And that's the A through F scale of maneuverability. 
Speed. Uh, total number of hexes moved can be changed to move as speed is speed, all right? Whatever your SR rating is. Full reverse. A ship can reverse its direction and move backward according to yada yada. Maximum reverse speed for most ships is about two hexes per turn. Stacking. Any number of ships can be in the same hex at the same time. You have 500 yards across and 500 yards forward. That's a lot of space. Plus three dimensional. So ships in the same hex have the option to ram, board, grapple, or engage in missile fire or magic. They're that close, they can let it all rip. Combat. There's two general types of combat in space. Long range and close combat. Now, long range is when they're shooting at each other with catapults and ballista and stuff. Close combat is things like you're close enough to shoot arrows. You're close enough to throw grappling hooks and jump across. You know, that sort of thing. The turn sequence and initiative. Now, initiative in 2E was done with a D10 roll low. As opposed to 5E's D20 roll high. Turn sequence and initiative. One, DM determines what actions the monsters or NPCs will take. The sh players will indicate what they and their ships are doing. So the, you know, the players are given that that little bit of info. Okay, they're going to do this. You can react how. Okay. Now we roll our initiative. Movement and attacks are made in order of initiative. Four steps. Okay. Long range combat can occur at any time. Short range combat can occur only when two ships are in the same hex. You do have optional, optional modifiers for initiative based on how experienced or inexperienced your crew is by one or two points on a D10. Long range combat. Okay, that's descriptions of how to shoot at things using other things. So your ballistas, catapults, etc. Even bows. Now, there was a rule in here that talks about the range. Okay. So, in 5e, you have short range and long range. Okay. Short range is up to a certain point, and you just shoot normally. Long range is up to a certain point, and you shoot at disadvantage using your normal bonuses. In... 2E, you would have short, medium, and long range. There was a point blank at one point. So you shoot it, shoot normally, shoot at negative 2, shoot at negative 5, shoot at negative 7. And they invented a new range for Spelljammer. So the end of long range, all the way out to, now long range varies by weapon, all the way out to the end of your line of sight is extreme range. And they take out that negative 7. And they turn it into a negative 10, so three points worse. Now, as your target gets further and further away, it is a tiny, 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 tiny spec you're trying to hit. You know, if there's a if there's a front sight post on your weapon, it is covering up the target. It's hard to see once they get out at that certain point. So there are rules for that. Now, if I was doing this in 5e and inventing an extreme range. I wouldn't make it three points harder because 5e characters have such high bonuses on everything compared to 1e or 2e. We have escalated all these numbers up, so instead of a three point, I would say keep the disadvantage and give them a minus five. So you make it significantly harder because some of these people are getting tens, twelves to, you know, bonuses to hit. Disadvantage by itself is not enough for extreme challenges. Uh, they talk about using Thaco, okay, and Thaco is hard for, for, for some people to figure. So, shorthand, if someone has, it's rated in Thaco, take 20, subtract the Thaco, and they just, that'll give you a number. That is their bonus to hit. So if someone has a Thacko of 17, 20 minus 17 is 3, they are rolling to hit with a plus 3 against whatever armor class. Now if armor class is 5, it's 5 points better than 10. That would be AC 5 for chainmail in uh, 2E, AC 15 on an ascending scale. Hit points. 
So ships are like hit points. Hull points like hit points. Ships have hull points, people have hit points. For every 10 hit points of damage in a single tight area, the ship will take one hull point. So if you have 10 arrows going all over the ship, doesn't matter, 10 arrows in one spot, well, they can inflict a hull point. Critical hits. Now, if you have a weapon such as a ballista that's capable of doing critical hits versus ships, you roll, you get your 20 with your ballista, you get a special table. Special table, okay? Roll of a one, you do an additional five hull points in addition to the hull points damage that you normally did from the weapon itself. Um, 15, ship shaken. The ship rings from the blow of the attack. You do your normal damage, but all characters not sitting or otherwise firmly tied down, the spell gemming mage themselves is considered secure, has a chance to fall to the deck, disallowing any attacks or spell you set around. So your, your catapult does just a perfect hit. Bam! Does your normal damage, plus everybody's uh, throwing around. Cool. Large weapon damaged. One large weapon chosen randomly is inoperable until repaired. So you have a critical hit table. Optional, but cool, you know. You're having effects happen in combat. You can narrate things as a DM happening, not just you did points, he did points, they did points, you did points. These guys ran out of points, they die. That's boring, right? You have effects happening that you can narrate and have happen. All right. Breaking up. When a ship is reduced to zero hull points, its internal structure is de destroyed and it begins to fall apart. Roll a six-sided die for every 10 tons of ship. Round fractions up. And that is the number of large, atmosphere re retaining, pieces of the ship that are left. Some victors will search through such debris looking for prisoners. Others will abandon them. It is possible for survivors to lash up some sort of vessel from the junk, make a raft, and then try to save themselves with a temporary helm or spell jamming mage. So, if your ship is destroyed, we have rules for what to do about it. You can still survive after your ship is destroyed. This could be the start of a new the start of a new era of your adventure. We have a twist in the plot, not a dead end. Effects of ship crew losses on ship performance. When you've killed a lot of the enemy crew, there's not enough of them to go around to operate the rigging or to operate the weapons. Debris. Ships moving through a debris field, such as an asteroid field, or through a section of a bunch of broken up ships, have to go through very slowly and carefully or suffer potential damage. Fire. What happens when there's a fire on board? We have rules for this. Morale. Optional rule morale. So, morale is a great thing that probably should have been brought in a 5e. So, if you're facing a bunch of goblins and you kill a portion of them, the rest of the goblins might likely flee. If you have a ship's crew, it is a guideline that the DM can use for what happens when a bunch of them are killed or when the enemy is like totally outnumbering them and starts yelling at them to surrender. You know, you have things you can roll. A typical crew member has a morale of 11. Some higher, some lower. So, <coughs> you can decide what to happens in the middle of combat when things start getting rough. Is your crew going to buckle down and face the challenge, or are they going to raise the white flag and throw the captain overboard? All right. Missile fire. Yay. Magic. Ramming. Ramming. How do how ships crash into each other intentionally? We have rules for that. The size of the ships involved matter. This, you know. Ramming gargantuan creatures. Some creatures are big enough to be almost considered ships. All right. Shearing attacks. Now, we're dealing with ships that are pointing in, in different directions. Shearing attack is when you, instead of ramming the ship, you decide to clip their mast off of them and so that they lose maneuverability. It's not realistic that a spaceship 
would suffer maneuverability from losing sails. But this is Spelljammer, it's wild, wacky magic space with air and not air. Air only around your little vessel as a pocket. Hey, it works, okay? It's just for because we're all playing magic pretending games with elves with sticks, okay? Just don't take it too seriously, right? <sighs> Towing, a ship that's grappled, maybe towed. All right, cool. Encounters, evasion, and running away. So, encounters happen randomly, but how do you run away? Well, they give you rules for that. You have to be more than 25 hexes away from anything of major size, including the enemy's ship. Your combat went poorly against you. You need to get 25 sh ship hexes away before you can jump into warp speed, we'll call it. Okay? So one way to do it would be to do that shearing attack, go straight at the enemy, shearing attack to reduce their maneuverability. You pass. They try to turn... You keep moving, you keep moving, you get that 25 hexes away and you bolt, okay? They have rules for how pursuit works. Now, I've heard there's no rules for evasion, for getting away, or no rules for pursuit in the 5e version. I don't know yet if that is true, but if so, there's 2e rules you could pull over, okay? Or you could scrap all of 5e rules and use exclusively the 2e, whatever. All right, I just told you how to convert uh, Thacko and Descending into uh, Ascending and boat rolled with bonus to hit. So anyway, you got your 25 hexes away and you jumped into warp speed. The other guys want to catch you. All right. So they need to make, the navigator needs to make an intelligence check. They get a plus two if they have the navigation proficiency. If so, they can get the very correct angle to follow you exactly, all right? Time is important for every round of delay since the departure of the first ship. Add one point to their die roll. After two turns of delay, the ship is irretrievably lost. The trailing craft does not know it's on the same track as its quarry unless the crew is aided by magical means. Now, the ship that is fleeing does have an option. If they have a 10 ton unit such as a single person craft that they can push off the stern of the ship they can jettison that large load and then the enemy ship will come into close contact with it and be forced to move slowly until it gets past it and then can jump into hyperspeed again at which point they'll have to make a second navigation check I think it says second navigation check anyway but you slowed them down You've bought more time at the very least. I think you do force a second navigation check. You're going to be really hard to catch. Unless they have a spy who found out in advance that you were headed to Omicron Percy I-8. So they don't need to really chase you to Omicron Percy I-8. They just have to go there and know you'll go there too. So that's their other option. Just saying, hey. And then we get to repair. No, I have heard there's repair rules in 5e, there's repair rules in 2e. We're kind of at the beginning and end of the combat rules. This is just an overview. But I'm letting you know this is this is my overview of the 2e rules. It seems complete. So if your 5e aren't, rules aren't complete, you do have an option. The print-on-demand ain't that much, man. The PDF's even cheaper. So... There it is. Pages 50 through 70. 20 pages. Um, in the future, I plan on reading the 5e Spelljammer. I plan on doing a compare and contrast of the ship-to-ship -ship rules. I've already read the ship-to-ship -ship rules here. I plan on doing a compare and contrast of the overall products. Uh, if there are any... If, if there are any topics you guys want me to uh, talk about, let me know in the comments. If I've gotten things wrong in here, please let me know in the comments. And uh, I hope to see you around. And I hope you guys will like and subscribe. I would appreciate that. 
And until next time, DM Kurt out.